Good morning, FFConf. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here with you all. I want to say a huge thank you to Remy and Julie for organizing this conference. I can only imagine how much hard work goes into this. And you've been doing this for 11 years. Yes, this is the 11th FF Comp. When I spoke to Remy whilst preparing my talk, he told me that FF Comp was about how to make the web a better place and about the future of the web. So before we come to the future, how about we take a look at the past? What has changed about the web in the last 11 years since Remy and Julie first started FFCOMP? Eleven years ago, about one quarter of the global population were active internet users, according to the World Bank. Today, that's more than doubled to around half the world. In 2008, Google released a new browser called Chrome. Now, it's the most popular way to use the web. The first Android phone was introduced, and the year previous, Apple released the first generation iPhone, and the idea that websites be mobile friendly came into play. A lot has changed in the last decade or so. What about the things that haven't changed as we would have liked? It's been five years since the most well-known tech companies first released diversity reports, revealing that workforces were overwhelmingly white or Asian men. Despite their business successes, none of these big tech companies has made much progress in, div in diversifying their workforces. In 2014, Apple, one of the largest tech companies by revenue, had 20% of its technical staff as women. This increased to only 23% in 2018. At Google, the share of US technical employees who are black rose by less than a percentage point since 2014. At Google, there were 1.1% black technical staff. It's now 1.5%. At Facebook in the US, there were 3% Hispanic technical staff in 2014. Last year, there were 3.1%. In the UK, UCAS data, that's our university enrollment service, from September this year, shows that 80% of computer science graduates were male. Similarly, UK tech employment reports show that this gender disparity continues in the workforce and that only 15% of employees are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. We have a persistent and structural problem with diversity in our engineering community. We've mentioned just two diversity metrics so far ethnicity, and a limited gender metric of male and female. But there are so many more. Age, gender identity, sexual orientation, 
economic or social position, education, faith, caring responsibilities, and how we approach problems and think about things. It's hard enough to build products tailored to our users. We're making this even harder for ourselves by creating hom homogeneous communities. There have been numerous reports of facial recognition systems that misidentify black people. A US government study found a top performing system misidentified black people five to 10 times more than white. Beyond building products for our diverse user groups, we must create communities that foster a sense of belonging for all. So, when we look to the future, I can't help but ask the following questions. What does it take to become a developer today? How is this journey supporting or hindering our goal of increasing diversity? And what can we do about it? This, dear friends, is a call to action. In no uncertain terms, I am asking for your help. Today, I want to convince you that you have the power to make the web a better place. By opening the doors to this industry and supporting new developers in our tech community, I'll show you how easy this is, how there's something that everyone can give in a way that is convenient and beneficial to all. I'll share my personal story. Then we'll step into the shoes of a new developer today and uncover their options. Finally, I'll give my advice to professional developers and engineering leadership about what they can consider doing to contribute to a more diverse engineering community. I joined The Guardian as a developer last month. Soon after joining, I was sat at my desk and looked around at the engineers sitting next to me. All of them ready and willing to answer my questions and offer guidance and support. This was what I had always wished for but I couldn't help feeling a little sad and a little frustrated. The memory of being on the outside, trying to get in, is still with me now. I can't feel truly happy knowing that there are still so many people, friends, still struggling to get their foot through the door. I know what it's like to travel across the city after work, missing out on bedtime with my child to spend one hour pairing at a meetup. When I reflect on the enabling environment I have at work and the access to so much learning opportunity, I can't help but feel a sense of injustice. I still know so many in this situation, and this talk is for them. The many others who will come also and make this journey. And it's for myself. I don't want to forget what it took for me to stand here in front of you now. And I don't want to stop feeling frustrated, deeply saddened, 
or to stop questioning why our industry is this way. I am a black woman. I am a mother. I am highly privileged. I do not represent every woman, every black person or person of color, nor do I represent every mother or carer. I am not a catch-all. I am unique. And when telling this story, I want us to remember this. I hope that I can give one perspective and share the lessons from my journey so that others can benefit. I want to speak to new developers. Those are people who are interested in coding, maybe haven't tried yet, who have started learning, or who are looking for their first job. I want to speak to developers like many of you who get paid to code and managers who control engineering budgets. I have a message for each of you. And I would like to share how you can shape the engineering community. Let me share my personal story of how I became a developer. Prior to teaching myself how to code, I was very lucky. I was living my dream of working across sub-Saharan Africa. I worked in finance and investment roles, which required a lot of travel. When my husband and I decided to start a family, I thought that I could continue my work and travel, <coughs> but this idea just proved my complete ignorance. After having Zacharia, I thought I would be back at work after three months. I didn't go back until he was 12 months old. My biggest challenge during those months was chronic sleep deprivation, which led to depression, but with the support of a baby sleep consultant, my counsellor, and of course my family, I managed to get back on my feet. And I started reflecting on my future. I knew I couldn't travel with the same intensity as before. I needed to find a different profession. I called upon our dear friend Google, and typed work from home into the search engine. I found that 80% of the jobs that looked attractive to me were for software engineers. The only problem was I didn't know any. The only engineer I knew was someone I had met 15 years prior during a school trip to Jordan he wasn't actually from my school, he was from my sister's school in the US. But despite the tenuous connection, he was kind when I got in touch. And as well as giving me some tips, he connected me to a mother on his team. <coughs> this theme of receiving help from strangers who didn't ask for anything of me in return has been the theme of my journey. I cannot express the extent to which my being here is as a result of the selfless kindness of others. After doing some more research, I looked into a popular boot camp and cold called about 30 alumni from there. Everyone responded to my messages and some people even responded within minutes. I would ask them for 10 minutes of their time on the phone, and my mission was to find out from them how best to test my hypothesis that I would enjoy being a developer. Everyone I spoke to was extremely helpful. To my surprise, I received a new piece of information from every developer I spoke to. This completely shocked me. It was as a result of these phone calls 
that I started contributing to open source projects before I could write a line of code. I got into a Code First Girls course and received advice on the best meetups to attend, like Code Bar. I learned how to code through the kindness and generosity of the engineering community. My journey was not without its challenges. Working full time and looking after a baby with little time for myself was challenging. I experienced burnout and had a very public breakdown in a React workshop. Yes, React can do that to you. <laughs> I also had to grow a very thick skin due to multiple job rejections. At one point, a friend and I used to compete on how many rejections we could get in one day. When I reflect on my journey, I can't help but feel, should it really be this hard? What does it take to become a developer today? Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a new developer, someone looking to get into the engineering industry for the first time. As a non-computer science graduate, the main routes in are likely to be a boot camp or the self-taught route. In this section, I will argue that boot camps are not accessible for all and that self-taught developers face a number of challenges to get into the industry. This could be having significant implications on diversity in the engineering community. People from underrepresented groups are not going to enter our industry as mid-level developers. They are not going to come into this industry as senior developers or managers. They are going to come in as entry level and junior developers. I believe that we, not, we cannot expect a meaningful change in the participation of underrepresented groups in engineering without changing their journey into it. Let's first look at boot camps. What does a boot camp offer? They give students a curriculum, peers to work with who provide accountability and motivation, and alumni for networks, teachers, hopefully, this isn't the case for all, and support to get a job, again, hopefully. There are some challenges with this option. Boot camps cost money, around £8,000 for one in London. And there's also the opportunity cost of not working for the duration of the boot camp. Plus, if you have a child, the additional childcare bill around at least £1,000 a month. This excludes a significant group of people. I really applaud the companies providing scholarships and salaries to people on boot camps. But these opportunities are too far and few between. If you don't live near a boot camp, one might not be accessible for you. One of my challenges was the inflexibility of such courses. As a mother who was breastfeeding, the thought of commuting into the city with no flexible hours felt too stressful. Boot camps have a reputation of being fast paced. Many tend to cover a range of material in three or four months before students have to find a job. Finally, there has been coverage on Twitter challenging the quality of boot camps. Kezia, a developer in the US, has made it their mission to uncover bad practices in the boot camp industry. And this is bringing up various examples of students paying for poor educational services. So if you're someone that 
cannot access a boot camp for these reasons or others, what do you do? The self-taught route is the option we will explore. This is the one that I took. Whilst this is of course challenging, for some, it may be their only option. The curriculum is an easy one. There are so many free online resources like those available from Free Code Camp and Code Academy. Those who are self-taught must find their own teachers and peers. This is probably the most defining part of my journey. I couldn't have done it without the kindness shown to me by developers willing to give their time for free. I found my own teachers through contributing to open source projects, attending free meetups, applying for diversity scholarships for conferences like this one, and cold calling people on LinkedIn. These teachers helped me with my code and they guided me on what I should be spending my time doing. There are so many options when you're teaching yourself which language to learn, what to build, which framework to use. That's where building a network and discussing these questions with peers and experienced developers can really help. It was getting a job that I struggled the most with. I really, really appreciate the entry level schemes that I benefited from. For example, the one that we have at The Guardian, the Digital Fellowship. There are other companies that offer such schemes, such as 8 Light, Sky, and BBC. Unfortunately, there just aren't as many as we need, and I think this is something we need to work on, which I'll speak about later. Related to this, tech interviews and recruitment processes are often flawed and can discriminate against those from unconventional backgrounds. It took me months to learn how to complete technical tests, and even now, they're a huge struggle. Tests often cover computer science fundamentals, even when the job in question may not require that particular skill. In, additions, in addition, employers must understand that completing tests whilst working and with personal responsibilities is extremely challenging. One HR recruiter I interacted with gave me a technical test on Friday and without asking any questions, expected it back on Monday. We need nothing short of a recruitment revolution in our industry. Overall, while there are significant challenges associated with the self-taught route, there are definitely some positives. You can set your own learning pace and define your own goals. You can give yourself ample time to search for a job, which decreases the stress associated with it. Also, you're likely to pay less money, which is a huge plus. So in this section, we've spoken about the features of a typical boot camp, why they are not accessible for all, and that those who choose the self-taught route face a number of challenges. They must find their own teachers. They may need to fit their coding practice around their working lives and personal responsibilities, as well as grappling with finding an entry-level job. Overall, it's not an easy journey. As professional developers, what can we learn from this. One of the main takeaways for us is that a non-conventional route into tech can be challenging and that people like you have the power to make all the difference. Change is in your hands. I am here because professional developers like you gave me their time, energy and support for free. It's a lot to ask, but I hope we'll convince you that you can have a hugely positive impact. We'll discover how you can give in ways beneficial to you 
and that match your needs. We want to create an engineering community highly attractive to underrepresented groups. One of the ways we can do this is by supporting new developers to get a foothold into the industry. There are many people struggling to get access to the knowledge they need to successfully pass a coding test or to gain the networks necessary to get their first job. We, who have the knowledge, experience and networks can unlock that door for them. The future of this industry is in our hands. Even if you have been coding for just one month, you have something to give. You can help someone who has just started. We're not limited to giving technical knowledge alone. Several engineers, some in this room, have supported me with regular check-ins just to see how I was getting on. Being a sounding board and a motivational voice can be just as important as pairing on code. So why bother listening to what I'm saying? Why give your time to help someone else? First, let's recognize that when we help someone, they are likely to go on to help someone else. And this chain effect can continue to have a positive, an exponentially positive value on our community. I have seen this in my own life where my mentors have received similar support from someone else and have paid this forward. Helping one person means you're likely to be helping several. Second, we know that teaching something enables us to gain mastery of that topic. When covering basic syntax with my colleagues, a number of them have commented that they appreciate getting a chance to refresh their knowledge. It's also really fun. I've spent time pairing with engineering managers who often don't get to code in their day job and relish the opportunity to solve a coding problem. Finally, I think the best senior developers are the ones who can empower and enable their teams. Mentoring others means that we can practice this skill and hopefully become fantastic technical leaders. So let me give you some ideas of ways you could get started or things you could do that you might not have considered yet. The first thing I want to present is pairing and code reviews, one of the most valuable things we can give to new developers. There are so many ways of getting involved. The most common is meetups that often take place in the evenings or on the weekends, such as Code Bar or Code First Girls. If that's not available to you, then some meet meetups have forums such as those on Slack. These are used to ask coding questions and receive code reviews amongst other things. I often resorted to using these when I was stuck on code and found them really useful. This is a great way to offer technical support asynchronously and from a place that suits you. Another platform dedicated to this concept is Exorcism, which I am a huge fan of. Mentors offer code reviews on submitted coding challenges. I've often found the mentors go above and beyond in their feedback and take so much care in this. The greatest challenge I faced was finding a job. I would often see job adverts and message developers who work there on LinkedIn to ask for support. Usually, people were really forthcoming. I know LinkedIn isn't everyone's favorite, but whatever platform it is, offering advice to new developers interested in working at your company is really beneficial. This could be done asynchronously too. You could write an article on Medium, post a Twitter thread, or make a YouTube video. 
Some developers offer their own office hours, which they do on a live stream, or some offer a few one-off mentoring calls with new developers. There are so many ways to help, which you can do in mediums and with regularity that suits you. Another great source of support came from conferences. I remember going to my first ever tech conference. I met a CTO who introduced me to his whole team. I couldn't believe that he took the time to really welcome me into their circle and make me feel like I could hang around with them. I'll never forget that gesture and I hope I can replicate it for others. I recently learned about the Pac-Man rule. This is where you keep an opening in your physical circle in the group you're speaking with to show that anyone is welcome to join your conversation. Short of holding a placard at conferences to attract new people to you, you can try participating in a conference's buddy scheme messaging on Twitter to say that you're happy to meet any new people and offer them a helping hand. <coughs> I'm really passionate about open source projects. It's actually one of the reasons I'm a developer today. The stats on participation on open source from underrepresented groups are in desperate need of change. You can help with this by being a great open source citizen, upholding best practices by giving positive and constructive code reviews, keeping documentation up to date and useful, offering help to new contributors, and even remote pairing with them if you can. Some amazing developers live stream their open source contributions, which is phenomenal. General mentorship cannot be overrated. I have a monthly call with a CTO who rejected me from his job application. I was really happy that he was willing to support me in this way. We discuss work-life balance and my goals. If you prefer this style of supporting people, this can be really valuable. We've spoken about a number of different ways to support new developers. Providing technical support, job application help, meeting new people at conferences like this, being a general mentor who supports on non-technical aspects. We've also seen that we can help people asynchronously, a few hours a week or just a few minutes. There are so many ways you can give in, that suit your time and other constraints. Nevertheless, you might still be thinking, Amina, there are still reasons why I can't do this. So let me try and anticipate some of these misgivings. You might be thinking, I'm struggling for time already. I cannot add another thing to my to-do list. I would say, do something really small regularly. For example, I'm mentoring a few new developers and every Monday morning on my train into work, I'll send them a quick DM on Twitter just to find out how their previous week was and what their plans are for the coming week. It's quick, but so incredibly effective. We tend to perform better when we're accountable to someone. This was a practice gifted to me from my mentors. You might be thinking, Amina, I've only just started coding, or I've only just got my first job. I don't know enough. I would say you definitely do. If you falter, Google is there, or there are other people that can help. Some of my most enjoyable moments are pairing with someone when we both don't know the language we're coding in. You might be thinking, Amina, I've never done this before. I don't participate in the tech community, and frankly, I just don't know where to start. If that's you, think about the options we've presented here and choose a place to start that best suits you. It's about experimentation. 
I'm sure you can find what works. The important thing is to just get started. The diversity metrics in our industry are simply unjust. Let's open the door and make it easier for people to join us here. I invite you to be part of the solution. The next people I would like to speak to are our engineering managers and anyone who has an influence on budgets and hiring practices. I have a bone to pick with you. <laughs> First, I find it saddening that our industry doesn't take better care of new developers. I feel it's one of the major bottlenecks keeping our community so homogeneous. Through my experience, I learned that junior developer roles were in fact not tailored to new developers. Take a look at some of the requirements. It's not unusual to see expectations of commercial experience in not just one language, framework or tool, but several. Software development is a craft, similar to guilds. It's a practice that is learnt not just once, but over and over again. Craftspeople typically learn through practice. Expecting diversity statistics to change in our industry without creating an open door is doomed to fail. Let's acknowledge that requirements for junior roles are often very high. We need more entry-level jobs. One of the things I love about my current employer, The Guardian, is that they've created a scheme specifically for those seeking their first developer role. We need many, many more such schemes. Let's also note that we cannot hire juniors without putting in place proper support frameworks. I like the idea of a ratio of three developers to every new developer, but every team is different. Find what works with you and design your teams and budgets with this in mind. How are we incentivizing our engineers to take part in the wider tech community? Not everyone, including myself, is able to give their evenings and weekends to do community work. If your engineers volunteer at a meetup in the evening, let them have the equivalent amount of time off the next day. Another great idea is to run office hours. This is where once a month you welcome new developers into your office where they can spend an hour or so pairing with your staff. Support engineers to pair with new contributors on active open source projects. I can't think of a plausible reason not to let your engineers volunteer for even just one hour a week. If this isn't available to you, you could consider sponsoring conferences like this with diversity scholarship. How about giving your office space for a meetup? I've noted a few ways you can influence your team as a manager. Offer truly entry level roles, support systems, and incentivize and encourage engineers to support new developers in ways that work for them. I feel indebted to the mentors who have volunteered their time to help me. And I always feel so positively about the companies who are doing this good work. You too can be part of this positive change. Today, we've spoken about some of the challenges new developers may face on their journey. We've noted that this makes it even less likely for us to build the diverse engineering community we so desperately need. We gave advice to professional developers and engineering managers on what they can do to help. We suggest developers pair with those seeking to enter the industry, offer support with job applications, and we noted that this work can fit a variety of schedules. We've challenged engineering management to support staff to give their time, incentivizing and encouraging them to do so, to offer supportive entry-level roles and programs. What would we like to say at FFConf's 20th anniversary? 
I would like to say we did our best to include people who face high barriers to entry into our profession. I would like to say we made the web a better place. Thank you.